My name is Subramanya. Close to 17, 18 years Building applications, software applications. I've been an architect, manager for all time. But I still continue to be an architect. When he here with a very good friend of mine, he said, uh, your institution was actually trying to do a software connect with the industry. In the sense that, what happens in the industry, would you like to talk with our young graduates, young teachers? So I said, okay, let me you know, give it a shot. I might not have done sessions like this, but yes, I have done sessions in the enterprise at least. And various other topics. Um, so today's topic is one of my favorite topics, which is talking on design and architecture. It is a very crucial tool, as well into my um, my day-to-day -day job also. That's what I do regularly. So why is, why design, architecture, why all these things? Why don't we just simply write a piece of code and then say, hey, here is the application. So how many of you are you know, have an aspiration to grow into software? Probably 15 people. So for these 15 people, I was like just talking to Venki. Up until let's say 1970s, software was actually not an engineering science. See, engineering science. Software is actually part of the mathematical community or the mathematics community. It was called a science. It's still called a science. It's called computation science. Say around 1980s, it was actually recognized as an engineer, and then uh, architecture, which was actually only limited to let's say stuff like uh, building up, building uh, construction or uh, manufacturing, it was only limited to these things actually. Work that extended even into software, and from there uh, we started having all these stuff called design art and architecture. What not and all this. So way back um, in so when it started, computation started way back in 1950s, 1940s probably. It was only meant for high-end institutions like universities, you know, large corporations, which could actually afford it. It was not even affordable. Only people who could afford it, organizations which could afford it, they were using the computer. Okay? And those were actually called mainframes. The problem is, the entire application, along with its data, everything used to sit in a huge single large box, single large box, and it was called a data center. The reason it was called a data center is because all your data along with the application used to sit inside a single large institution. Don't worry, the movie has just started, so you can actually teach it, but please be start seated in the frame. Seated in the frame. So software architect. Why software architect? How many of you have actually used Amazon? Any regularly used part of it? How many of you know that Amazon is not a single application? Zero. Up until recently, let's say three years back, four years back, everybody was wondering Amazon is a single application. Amazon is actually a piece of applications put together to work like a single application. Yeah, we have some more participation. You can actually take it. Come <laughs> 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 So as I was talking, Amazon is not a single application, instead it's a piece of application or a group of applications brought together. So this whole story starts around 19, 
90s probably. That's when internet started picking up and that's when you know, applications started taking a different pace of being built in a different format. Up until then, applications, or software applications, were mainly meant only for banking facilities, universities, research institutes, defense. Defense used to use a lot of uh, these uh, computational facilities and that's how even our internet that we use today was actually part of a defense experiment. It was called ARPANET because it was part of a defense organization. And later on it was contributed to the public, uh, to the open source. And that's how we use uh, the internet today. And uh, part of it, even a lot of the you know, languages, programming languages that we use, actually born out of all these research projects. They were not, you know, introduced out of the blue and then they were started, you know, they started being used at all. So way back applications were built using programming languages which were very close to the machine and then which were directly, they used to be directly, you know, put into the machine and they were called machine languages. Something like an assembly programming language. You program directly to an assembly uh, that you have, something like H0, H6 architecture. So the application used to sit within the hardware that it was constituted. We still use it, it's called microcontrol programming. But the there are advantages and disadvantages. The advantage is that the application sits within the whole architecture you design, is in the sense the hardware you are designing. But the disadvantage is that you can't port it to some place else. That is, you can't take it right here and then put it somewhere else, it won't work directly. It will have to be tweaked a little bit, and then it will start working with that new hardware that you are trying to associate with. Right? That's where the commercial usage of applications started coming up. And when you say commercial usage, it's like the banks using it for their the regular operation, and then uh, companies, enterprises using it for making all their payroll, and making all their employee management. So all these applications started coming up, and then the first the first race of building commercial applications, Cobol was actually the leader. Cobol was a very primitive programming language, it was just an English-like programming language and everything in Cobol was written in simple English-like language and uh, the problem with that is that you have a huge program just to print out a simple computation and then storage. Storage was another part of that. Right? So as the uh, as the life cycle of application building went ahead, people, uh, people invented a programming language called C, uh, then C++, then came in Java, then came in JavaScript, all the other things actually fall apart in the line, like Ruby, Python. They had different usages, they had their own model of programming, they had their own experiment of doing things, their own way of executing things, and then one of them took lead, you know, let's say, a leap bound leap. Some of them actually took a lead into only mathematical computation, like Fortran is the forefront of you know mathematical computation. And Python also contributes a lot into data science. Java contributes a lot into building you know business applications. JavaScript contributes a lot into print end applications, building print end applications, like all your Ruby based applications, so and so forth. Now where does architecture fall into all these things? Where does architecture design and all these things? Like for, for everything that you are trying to build, as I said, architecture design were actually meant initially for uh, construction, like you are building construction and all those things, manufacture, automotive manufacturing and stuff like that. So it all started when industry automation started taking place. When I say industry automation, what comes to your mind, you know, in the first instance? What do you think industry automation is? Anyone? Yes, we open it could be wrong, it could be right. We are here for an interactive session, so you can just be open, you can state anything. How many of us regularly use a two-wheeler? Right? A two-wheeler initially was hand-built. Hand-built, yeah. They used to be a factory. People used to bring in all these spare parts. Some of the companies actually used to manufacture all these spare parts using hand. 
that is manual labor, assemble them manually, right? Some of these are still done like that only. That is, they are hand built and their cost is too high. You won't believe their cost is too high. <coughs> Some of them are automated. So there is, a, there is an automation train upon which each and every part is first initially starts with a ground zero. Then step one, step two, step three, step four, and then finally you get the actual product out of it. And then it is sent to quality testing, and then after that it is sent to all the other painting and everything, and then the actual product comes out of it. That's called industry automation. Right? So you have an automated infrastructure to do all these things. So that means there is a certain design they'll have to follow. Saying that hey, this is the two wheeler I wanted to design. So the particular infrastructure I'm going to use should also have its design such that each and, every, each and every step you are incrementally producing the product. Right? They start with the engine, then they start with the frame of the uh, two-wheeler that you are trying to manufacture, then the integration of the engine and the two-wheeler, then all the other nuts and bolts are coming to picture, then at the ending the light, uh, the two-wheeler tires and everything they come in. And then by the end of the train, it's called a train, by the end of the train, you actually get the product. And then it goes in for quality checks and all those things. They're either accepted at a quality check and then it comes out. Then it is sent to the dealers and all that. So everything is an automation. There's a process in place. So there's an architecture in place. That's where the whole thing comes up. It's the same is the case with construction also. Initially, you know, when construction industry started picking up, the way all these buildings were built was like one floor after the other, one floor after the other. But now look at how buildings are being built. It's all automated. Right? When I say automated, you actually have modular structures coming into place and they just fall into place like Lego blocks. Previously, 10 years back, probably 15 years back, it used to take to build, let's say, a 10 story building around one year, two years. Now it takes hardly three months, four months. Because we know how what is the architecture of the building, you know what is the weight of the building, all the other parameters, they're all computed, and then accordingly RCC structures are built, modular structures are built, they just bought it, bolted up, and then all the concrete is built in, and then you have the building immediately, in three, four months, you have the whole building infrastructure finished. Okay, so we have talked about architecture into other industries. So where does architecture fall into software? Even applications are built the same way. You won't know if you have heard the term called design patterns. Design patterns was never designed. They were never designed. The gang of four design patterns. They were never designed. Never designed for software, for writing programs. No, they were never designed for writing programs for software. Anything related to software, they were actually designed for these things, for manufacturing, for architecture. That is for you know the building architecture and stuff like that. Later on, they were adapted into building software applications, then they were slowly modified, and then we started using them and today we have knowledge of so many of these things. The simplest one being the singlet, singleton pattern, then we have factory pattern, factory pattern, factory method pattern. They don't talk about anything about class pattern, object pattern, no. They're all designed actually for the industry. And later on, the software industry started adopting them. And then you start hearing all these terms and then you, because I come from that age where it started in 1990s and then I have been through 2000, 2001 and then current age. So it has evolved a lot. So it all started, as I said, with you know simple commercial applications where the applications initially were directly written into the hardware that you are using. Later on, People started writing in English like languages like the ball and all this thing. Then it went to the C, C++, then it went on into Java, JavaScript, blah, 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 and it is still continues. There are so many languages which are still emerging and then they are taking on the industry like anything. Right? So there has been an age for every application architecture. The initial age of application architecture was all machine language programming. The term machine language programming is trying to say that the application has been built for a particular machine, a machine like a calculator, a machine like 
an encrypted decryptor, which was used in World War II to actually encrypt and decrypt the messages. It's called Enigma, right? And then machine like your current architecture of x86 and all those things. Then it falls on. After that, it went on into the application architecture for commercial applications. We started calling them monolithic computation. The term monolithic, if you hear it carefully, monolithic actually comes from the manufacturing industry, that is the automobile manufacturing industry. Monolithic is trying to say it's a monobody infrastructure. The whole thing is built from a single cube or single model of a solid. So that is called monolithic. That means the entire body of the, of the particular manufacturing unit is built out of a single uh, let's say unwelded, unwelded architecture. That's what is called a monolithic application. Let's say a monolithic, what does a monolithic application look like? Your application, its own data, all the logic of the application, everything sits together. So if I wanted to show it pictorial. I wanted to show it pictorial. How many of you are like? Sorry. So, how many of you are like into probably your first year of engineering? All, all, all of us. Great. So, how many of you have ever? Okay, you might have started, you know, building applications, simple programs, simple. small programs, right? Yeah. Okay, not a problem. This might look a little foreign. Uh, don't worry, by the end of the session it won't be foreign anymore. It will, it will be our own uh, domestic product. Right? This is what you talk once you get into the industry. These are the jargons, these are the terminologies that you talk into the industry. Right? How many of you have actually, you might not have even seen an UML diagram also, right? A unified modeling language. Right? Okay, fine. Yeah. Python. Python, C and Python. Uh, C, C is my favorite. So, so, let's talk like this. A monolithic application. We just spoke about what a monolithic architecture is in terms of an automotive industry. Everything is built from a single block. When I say single block, a huge sheet of aluminum or huge sheet of stainless steel is taken. It is, it is like molded into a single block where it looks like a car. It only looks like a car. The mold is prepared in such a way that it looks like a car. And then all the other components are actually put in into that, into place. Either the seats or the engine and everything. The same is the case for an application. Everything is sitting inside a single piece. Inside a single piece. And this is what is called a monolithic application. Your entire application logic, your entire application data, the front end that you see in point terms of either being a web UI or a mobile UI, everything is actually sitting with the application. This is where it started. People started building applications like this. I see a lot of dotted faces. That's okay. As we talk, you know, it would start, it would be more interacting, but yeah. So this is how it started. You had a huge application together, put together, and every time uh, the application was like put into production for usage, this whole thing that you see, the application data, logic, everything, that is logic is written in terms of your program, like C, C file, C program files, or uh, Python program files, and then they are compiled into an exe, or a library accordingly, if it is Microsoft and platform, Microsoft platform, it's called DLL, but if it is on the other side of the world, where I use Java a lot, then it is into a class architecture, you have a JVM sitting across which does the entire architecture. Right? So, your application is packaged like this and then it is put into a machine. What's the machine we are talking about? The machine we are talking about is called an idiot box. Yes, it's called an idiot box. And the same idiot box is something we have in your homes. It's called a television. Yes, the only difference between a television and a computer is that a computer has a nice, powerful microprocessor. A television has a microcontroller. 
which is designed to work only video and audio. Nothing else. But your microprocessor can actually process data, store data, retrieve data, send data across a network, receive data from a network, again process, store, retrieve. It does all those things. But your television doesn't do that. That's the reason they are called idiot boxes. Right? They are called idiot boxes because they, they can actually do only things that are told to them to be done. Nothing apart from them. So they, this entire thing that you are seeing right now actually sits into one of these idiot boxes which is either a computer or a mobile phone or it could be a handheld device also. So handheld devices are something that are mainly used in places like airports, seaports. They are used for identification. Simple. Uh, what happens in a in something like a warehouse, where all products are actually put across, like Amazon's warehouse. You order so many things, they are not directly delivered to you from a vendor. Instead, a vendor actually ships it to Amazon. Amazon has a warehouse, which is a huge go-down kind of thing. And then what Amazon does, it scans each and every product, each and every product. Then it decides what is the source, what is the destination. And then accordingly it will sort them out accordingly by pin codes, by destination and all those things. How do they do that? They have something called a small handheld device. And that handheld device also have, has a program. Like this. Programs, 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 programs. Whatever we are doing today is also a program. Yes, we have decided that we wanted to do this thing for this amount of time and we wanted to have this many amount of people. And some guys didn't get the deck and some guys actually listening to the program. Program. Same thing is also a program. You are saying what is the input, what is the output, what should be computed, what should be stored, where it should be stored, how it should be received. All the questions are being answered. What, how, when, where, why. That's called a program. And this program, by an architecture, someone like me, it's called a monolithic application. Because it's trying to do everything on its own. It's an all-in-one. Have you heard this proverb called King, you know, Jack of all, King of none? Monolithic application is a Jack of all, but King of none. Why are you telling you? This is why. It's called a Jack of all. Because the whole application actually sits inside a single box. The whole application sits inside a single box. The problem with that is that the whole application is packaged into a single artifact. When we are talking about an artifact, this application could just be going into gigabytes. And at enterprise rate, when they are deployed, someone like Amazon, they don't just deploy it into one single box. They have customers, you know, being accessing data from different locations, different countries, different devices, different internet capabilities. Like our internet capability here could be very strong, back at home could be very weak. So think what they are trying to do. They are actually streaming data for a very low internet device and a very strong internet device. Very high computation device, very small computation device. So that means their data center capability should have been very strong. That means they should have to deploy this, something like this into, let's say, a million devices. One gig into a million devices itself goes into terabytes. Right? And deploying it is called, is a way of taking this program and putting it into a hardware infrastructure that is popping from A to B. And popping into A from A into a million B is definitely going to take X number of days of Right? Deploying is nothing but just copying from A to B. That's what is called deploying. Only that, it actually unpacks itself and then creates its own environment that it needs and then starts, right? It's like ready, okay, give me the request. I'll process the request, I'll send the response. Right? So, you deploy the whole thing. You say, yay, we have deployed the whole application version 1. Tomorrow, you know, someone like a project manager or business owner, they come in and say, they actually wanted to change this particular functionality here. This particular functionality here. That is for a map, I wanted to actually show the images in a different format. 
for mobile, I want to show them a different format. So the team like Kaz, like Kaz, people who go into the software industry, software teams, they accept the challenge and they say, okay, let's build the application, let's change it to actually behave differently. For a Mac, for a mobile, for a TV, and they deploy the whole thing. As I said earlier, this is just a damn thing, could be one gig, here you make a change, delta of it could be 1.5 gig, into billion devices. That means your nightmare never ends actually. Your nightmare is incremental by nature every day. And that's the nightmare we go through every day. And we don't know if a small piece of it fails, the whole piece of it fails. Make sense? Because this is a single large thing, a small piece of it fails, the whole piece of it fails. So that means all the one and a half million deployments you have made, actually so all your customers will immediately call your customer here and say, hey, this, this thing is not working. You know what? Every time a customer calls up a customer care, companies actually end up paying 18 to 25 dollars to the customer care representative to answer the call. <laughs> Think something like this goes down into a billion customers you have, billion into 25 dollars, 25 million gone. That is just for one call. That is what for one issue. Multiply it by the number of issues you have, one billion gone in one day. There have been companies which have faced something like that. Right? It's something like this. So software application architecture also started evolving. People started saying, hey, this is not a scalable architecture. A new term came up. Something called scalability. What is scalability? This application it says I can cater to a to at least one lakh customers a day on a normal day. That is on a regular business day. Amazon companies like Amazon, Flipkart, they all do something called Amazon Days. Some festival, some art festival comes in, they immediately say, hey, Amazon Festival Day. The spike immediately goes up. People who never wanted to buy something, at that day, they would just go on to Amazon. It's a trend actually. Plan to buy something, not just Amazon. Take my word for granted. Every other company or every other store in every other major city does that. It's a marketing gimmick. That is on, you know, during the festival days, people have the tendency to actually spend more, bring in something new. They feel it's auspicious. It doesn't matter whether it's online or offline, it happens. Take my word. Just go and search. Even any small store, large store, big store, enterprise store, online, offline, they would do this. During a festival, three days before, at least closing, they would put on offers and say, hey, we have given you bumper offer, so you can make a party. People do that. People buy like anything. Someone like me buys like anything, actually. I buy you know, mostly during the festival season so that I get that discount and then I can actually buy more of it. Now with that what happens is, this is not scalable. Because right now I have deployed them in million devices for 1 lakh customers. On these days, that 1 lakh actually goes up to 10 lakh. On million devices, they start rattling. They start making noises, cracks. Because they have been built, or this thing has been built only for 1 lakh customers. That is, it's ready to accept 1 lakh customers at a time and then respond back to them. When it goes up to 10 lakhs, it's not that scalable. See this new term called scalable? Why is it called scalable? It's like you have a car. Accident capacity of the car is 5 feet. But in an Indian mindset, you can fit 10 people. <laughs> Believe me, you can fit 10 people. But in company, in, in countries like US, Europe and all those countries, right? Say, no, 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 no. Five people, you can max fit four people only. If you need to fit more people, buy a larger car. Or have more cars. Husband has a car, wife has a car, child, the children, they have their own cars. So that means scalability comes in. Scalability also comes in here. So someone like me, a software architect says, vertical scale. That is vertical scale. I say, okay, put in more boxes. 
you already have million boxes. How about add a million more? Business manager immediately comes in and says, what do you think what a million is? Each box that you have actually deployed, I am ending up paying hundred dollars per day. Hundred dollars per day. Which is a regular business pattern. You are saying create it to one million more. He is putting in hundred million more. What is scalable to factor? Only for three days. For three days you want this expenditure and show me thus for this particular output. That okay, I can actually bring this business back and value of this particular expenditure back. That's what people think. You are investing something, what is the output order? Profit, loss. Right? So this scalability factor actually goes down. Though I say as an architect, hey, how about we just scale it to X number of boxes? Now that X number of boxes is by region. That is in India I want it, in Singapore I want it, Australia I want it, in US I want it, in Europe I want it. It's like multiplied, it's an exponentiated, exponentiated value I Now my expenditure is just bloated like that. The business team comes back to me. They are going to ask me what is the output of this. Okay, we are ready to scale it up. Can you promise us that the business will, will actually scale to that particular level then, then that revenue that we are actually putting on this. The term is called ROI, Return on Investment. How much I have invested, what is the return? So, the second thing immediately comes in. A small change within the application would need a complete makeover. And they are not scalable. We just talked about scalability. And it's tough to build up, you know, application architecture with varied computation. Varied computation is. Yes. Look at this thing. Let's think this is a simple online store. What functionality do you expect in an online store? Something like a card? Yeah. Showcase products? Yes. Login? People would have products. Categories of products? Delivery? Okay. How about pay, making payments? Yeah, making payments. Filter option. Search. Right? Okay, let's take the top five things. People would like to log in. Right? Then people would like to go through all the product catalog that we have. Then people make a decision that, hey, I wanted to buy a product A, B, C. They choose all the products, add it to the cart. And then ultimately they come to the payment thing. Then after payment, they go and get ready for delivery, fulfillment. Then after that, they would want to know the tracking. When is, when is it going to be delivered to my address and where is it sitting right now and all that. Okay? You know what is a heat map? Heat map. A heat map tells you about where is the maximum concentration of hits coming in to your particular website. You know, where are your customers more engaged? Are they taking more time to log in? Are they taking more time to browsing the product? Are they taking more time to add in products to a car? Are they taking more time to make a payment? Where are they taking? You know, where are they actually right now? Where are your most of your customers? Because most of the customers log in, come to a product catalog, they don't add it to the car. So like me, window shopping. I just go window shop. You don't try anything, you just go for shopping right there. It's called window shopping. Right? We look at the catalog of all the products and finally say this guy doesn't have that particular thing I'm looking at. Done. <laughs> shop it also. I go to a mall, 90% of the time that's what I look at. I only do window shop. Right? So even the mall architecture, they look at all these things and they make sure that customers actually go through this row, that row, that row, that row, and then they go to the how many of us have visited IKEA? How much time does it take? It takes 4 hours, 5 hours. Why does it take 4 hours, 5 hours? They have designed it meticulously so you go through every line. That's what is called design. Right? They are making sure that the customer goes through every corner in their store in a circular fashion and then end up at the counter. So that means they are forcibly making you pick a bottle of water, pick a bottle of this thing. You don't need it. But someone else is buying it. So you need that, you feel that oh, this might need in the future. 
put it in the cart, put it in the cart, put it in the cart, you reach the, uh, the actual counter, but you end up buying nothing. You just pull everything out of the cart and you say, I'm done. So that's what is called heat map. They know where your customers are actually making or spending most of the time and then making the purchase. So if you look at the heat map of our online store application, most of the time people spend it logging, viewing all the products, then the heat map starts coming down, adding to cart, then it comes down, making the purchase, then it comes down, tracking. Because after making the purchase also, people cancel it. Yes. So if you look at the heat map, one thing you'll have to understand with this architecture is the computation is equally distributed to everything. Void of whether it is online, do people viewing online catalog, adding to a card, making a purchase, tracking your order, or anything, the computation is always equally distributed. So that means, if I wanted to increase the computation power of just online logging, people logging into my application, people looking at the products in the application, I can't do that with this architecture. I can't give more power to just, you know, the online catalog viewing because that's where more people are actually there. I can't give more competition just to people viewing more of, more competition to people viewing products, more competition to people adding to a card. And that's where people are actually pissed off. Right? What is the worst thing that happens to you when you go to a store, at least in Hyderabad? Bangalore, it's even worse. Where? Yeah. But can they, can they actually scale? Yes, if they have more counters, it will take less time. But what if all the counters are filled in? Exactly. That doesn't happen. It's the same problem they are also facing. Right? That's the challenge with the monolithic application architecture. Make sense? So this is where, you know, architects like us, at least you know, historical people beyond me, before me, have actually said, how about we bring in a service-oriented app. Yes, yes. There are seats here. There are seats here. What happens when you go to a cricket stadium? Do you sit in the back or in the front? You sit in the front, man. You want the maximum view. Why you sit in the back? You look at everything in a zoom. Yeah, so the whole concept or the whole mindset started changing when the internet started taking storm. Right? When the internet started taking storm, have you ever seen Amazon's website way back in 2000? This is how it used to They used to sell books. Only books. Amazon used to sell only books. And the way you used to sell books is by showing a catalog like this. This is the book. This is a small image of the book. This is the detail about the book, the authors and everything. And you can't order it online. <laughs> you have to call up Amazon. You have to call up Amazon. And then Amazon CEO. Who is Amazon CEO? Sorry. Jeff Bezos. Jeff Bezos. You should take the call personally. Take the call personally, write it on a piece of paper. That is, what is your address? What is the card number? If you are making an online purchase. And everything, and then take the address and everything. If the payment goes through, if the payment goes through, there is no cash and delivery. You US never had a cash and delivery. Even now, they still don't do that. You have a question of why? Because fraud in US is way beyond what it is in India. We have learnt a lot from US, so we know how different we do. So he used to take it manually on a piece of paper, and then after everything is filled in, he used to take the books, package them, he had four and five back then. This was Amazon. And Amazon's problem was, they can't scale. So how did they scale? They employed 100 people, they paid the order. Back then internet was very slow, internet was not interactive, internet was only meant for static pages, just display pages like this. This was Amazon, way back in 2000. Right? So, architects like me thought, let's have a change in the mindset that we have. Let's 
bring in something called scalability. Before this, we should talk about this. Then we'll talk about this. Yeah. Yeah. So, service-oriented architecture. People start, people started thinking, how would I convert all my features in my application as services? <laughs> Simple services. Web services, services, and then give computation to the services that are there. So that login as a service, add to cart as a service, product catalog as a service, payment as a service, everything as a service, bring in everything as a service, and every time the customer is actually going to these services, which are again monolithic by their own nature. People, if people are like navigating from application A to application B to application C to application program A to program B to program C. And the link between all these things, they used to be a small station to the The application used to break these programs everywhere. And that's where the whole concept of hacking came. Internet hacking. Right? Without even uh, making a payment, I used to make a claim that, hey, I have purchased, made this payment for this particular product catalog. I didn't get it. Companies used to lose, companies used to lose a lot just by making a claim like that, right? So service servant that architecture also took flight for a long time, and that's where all the concept of an enterprise bus and all these things came in. And that also was one of the uh, architecture ventures which happened for scalability. And some other scalability, uh, you know, scalability architecture designs that came in was like virtualization, containerization, and then Microsoft microservices past and ideas. We we'll talk about each of these things. This is what is the talk about, all about. I took a long, long amount of time only to talk about monolithic architecture because we wanted to know what is the next level. Right? Your foundation should be strong and then you build everything, everything upon that. Make sense? Okay. So the first thing. Scalability actually took a different turn. Someone like me, an architect, way back in 2000, I would have said, add more hardware. Add more hardware is like putting more computer boxes in a single box. But in a data center, something like this doesn't sit. It's called a server. It has a huge 30 degree RAM. It, has, it used to have five to six processors on the road, on the board. <coughs> and then a, net, a couple of network connections, that is network cards associated to each a port that used to be a server. And there used to be a million servers in a huge data center. And it had to have a huge cooling effect of because processors emit a lot of heat and then it used to have its own electricity problems and cooling problems and all these problems. problems. So one intelligent guy said, how about on the same board we actually put in racks of microprocessor boards. That's what is called RAID. On the same board, you have multiple you know, microprocessor boards. Each board having its own microprocessor, RAM, network RAM, and then a box. Still, application started consuming more of these resources. More and more of these resources. No, why? Why does that happen? There is something called Moore's law. I know that's in physics. It's even there in computation. So the more you go ahead, the more computation you consume. The more you progress into the century, the more technology advances, the more computation you rise to consume. The more computation is the more infrastructure. The more infrastructure is the more consumption of electricity. So actually exponentiation. So, this was not working. Government started saying, hey guys, you are actually causing problems to the environment. You are bringing in more of these companies with data centers and you are bringing in more heat, more electricity. You are consuming everything that is available in the rest of your company. It just lasted. So, universities started experimenting. They started doing research. And the first research was actually worth 
Yes, what should I issue? Actually, being part of a research paper, wherein it said, uh, oh, I'm asking you. So, virtualization was actually a research paper wherein they said, now what? We use the same infrastructure by virtualizing it as multiple instances. That is the same infrastructure. On the same infrastructure, we deploy multiple operating systems or multiple OS layers on the same infrastructure. And the same infrastructure is used by these OS in a time capsule. So there will, there will be a traffic police, would be, it's like a program. We're saying that, okay, this particular client needs this computation, so I give these five parts. It is actually finished computation, it's going to write something to a database. Writes are always slow, reads are also slow, only computation. That's where you have to up to the microprocessor comes in, otherwise it's all the normal traffic that you have on the So every time something needs to be computed, I'll give you a control. Your, my, your processing is finished, give the control back to me, I give it to someone else. It's called time shift. And virtualization is one just concept similar to time shift. But it's going to virtualize everything right from your hardware to your OS and then time share it to all the requests that are coming. And one step about virtualization is containerization. That is, you're virtualizing by saying that hey, I'm going to virtualize the hardware I have. I'm going to virtualize the software I have, but how would I make it like a container? That is, I create virtual worlds. Virtual worlds. You see a traditional server architecture, see. You have an OS, you have the hardware, OS and the application. This is the model of the carpet. That is the model of the carpet in the left, extreme left. The next one is a virtualized carpet. If you see that on the same hardware, you have a virtualization layer, and upon that, you have multiple OS, the app is called same hardware. If you think this has a box, the same box is being used by multiple such applications. So I'm able to scale my application. This is one way of scaling your application. Then, containerization is just a step about. Even in the power, even in the virtualized layer, if I pick one box and I say, let's put containers. Container is just the application along with its own utilities put together. And then n number of such containers can actually sit in one virtualized, virtualized box. And such virtualized box can actually distribute my box and then scalable to pack. That's at the hardware level. The application is still the same. You still have that monolithic application sitting like this. Instead of sitting one single box, you're saying, okay, let me cut this box into smaller, 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 smaller boxes. But your application is still the same. One piece of the application fails, the whole thing fails. You still haven't solved that problem. This population is at the hardware level, at the infrastructure level. The next level of virtualization, which we are talking about, is at the software level. And this is where, when we say service oriented architecture, we are talking about software being distributed into services. So the first statement I made, how many of us think Amazon is a single application? Let's bring that statement. How many of us think Amazon is a single application? It is actually not. It is actually a group of services which are working together to you to look like a single piece of application and make sure that one point of failure doesn't impact you. You know what is a snowball effect? We use the term a lot. In fact, it is used even in our economy or snowball effect is Snowball starts at the top of the mountain, starts rolling down, it starts rolling down, it starts rolling down, and then by the end of the mountain, huge snowball. So somebody creates a problem at the top of the mountain, if it is not contained there, it becomes a huge snowball at the bottom of the mountain. So that somebody is actually kicked out at the top of the mountain. Did they connect? Yes. In academia also, snowball effect 
happens. Even in your regular life, no ball effect happens. You have a problem, you try to solve that problem, you create more problems. In the computation industry also it happens. We have a problem, we try to solve that problem, we just created more problems. So, someone again started thinking a little differently. This time, the academy also participated along with the industry, like what we are doing today. And the academy and the industry sat together, they said, my question see, we are already doing this thing. But only, only that, without intention, without intention, without a standard, we are actually doing all these things. That is building applications like services, we are actually doing these things. This is called service-oriented architecture. There is a concept called enterprise services. We are exposing all the services that we have created around an enterprise service first which was taking in all the requests and saying that hey, you need login, okay, let me call the login for this. You need a, adding to a card, let me call the adding to a card. You need it for making a purchase, let me call it. So, people say, how about we take this single service, isolate it, that is decouple it, cut it out from the piece of cake you have, deploy it as a single service. That way, the other application still works, won't fail. Only that you are adding to part functionality, won't work. People will still be able to go through the catalog, they can call you up and say, hey, I wanted to add this part, this product, this part. But unfortunately, the feature is not. The customer gets then immediately says, okay, let me add it. You know, actually, I can make the purchase on your behalf. You will have to give me a trade card ticket. So the flow is still continuing. But in the previous slide that we saw, it was all broken. That was Amazon's problem. And Amazon was one of the pioneers in actually helping solve this problem. It created the problem, even solved the problem. But yes, Amazon didn't solve it. Another company, which we all view regularly, Netflix, actually solved that problem. And prior to Netflix, back in US, there was a huge company called Blockbuster. Yes? So, you should go and watch the story of Blockbuster. What happened was, Blockbuster is a video rental service. Video rental service. So, back, way back in my days, my childhood days, we didn't have CDs, online services, online viewing, all these things. If you wanted to view some, some, some video content, you ideally had to go to the theater, if it's a movie. Now, sometimes, you know, some of these, there were these airing theaters which used to air scientific content, scientific research content, child, uh, child movies or child cartoons and stuff like that, we'd have to view in those theaters. Something like yeah, Rabi Dirbharati and all this, they used to do that. The other, the other way of viewing content is stored video content. That is in a cassette, you used to have a video cassette. At least, sir, you would have, you know, you still remember the video cassette days, VCR days, right? So, there used to be a huge uh, 3 inch by 5 inch video cassette, you used to put it into a VCR, you used to play by a lens. And then Blockbuster was one company which was like renting these video cassettes to all people and they, they used to rent it for 2 days, 3 days. Internet, internet was like taking by a storm. So Netflix clicks in and then they say, how about we stream the country online? Instead of renting it, we'll stream it. Initially they were renting it online. They said, you don't have to walk to a store, we don't have a store. You don't have to come to, come to our store and rent it and all that. Online, pick a content, order it, we mail it across to you. You view it, after you view it, just drop it at the nearest FedEx location, we'll pick it up. Then they thought, okay, we are mailing it, how about we stream it? They built huge streaming services, because internet was taking storm those days and streaming services started picking, picking up. And the other streaming service that was still in its infancy, like competing with Netflix, was YouTube. <coughs> YouTube also started as a research project by some guy called Chan. And then after that, Google came in and then the whole history was created. Yeah, you know, it came into picture what this you say. So Netflix thought, okay, we want to stream it. Perfect, all right. But the problem is, how do we tell the customer that you have viewed this content for this many number of times? 
how do we charge the difference? Right? A video cassette was like per view pay, per view pay. That is, you bring it one time, you pay it one time. You bring it second time, you pay it second time. It's not that you have seen it one time, so second time you are taking it, you, you don't have to pay it again. No. Per view pay. That is pay per view. Pay per view. How many times you wait? That many times you pay. How do I know how many times the customer is viewed it? He'll start at you know one minute, he'll wait at 20 minutes, he'll stop and pause it there. Now he'll start at one minute again. Right? Or he starts at one minute, he comes to the 59th minute, 60 minutes is the video, he again start one. So since 60 is not complete, I won't charge him. Yes, okay, this is a problem we'll have to solve. So Netflix actually produced some of the open source libraries or microservices or building microservices and they have contributed to the open source community. And that Netflix open source community is what is today's Pivotal company and Pivotal is owned by Dell. Dell is one of the companies that owns Pivotal, which actually brings in standardization into microservices. And Amazon was the pioneer, why I say that? Because they have created this problem to understand how a monolithic application has a problem with scalability and then how they have solved this whole thing using a service oriented architecture and then their own sort of microservices, their own services, web services. And from web services, it actually created another company, another company called AWS. Whatever they were using inside their own company, they said, okay, how about we productize it? So that other companies can also use it. That's how AWS was born. Say an idea, an idea out of an idea. That's what we want you people also be doing. You have an idea, don't kill that idea at yourself. We want you to step up, stand up, and say, hey, I have this idea. No idea is big, small, bad, good, until it actually converts into an innovation. Believe me, there have been companies which thought we are big to pay, and they have paid. They've just stopped it. The next day, Blockbuster, one year later, it actually went into bankruptcy. There's a new, nice video about Blockbuster going into bankruptcy, every one of you should watch that. The same happened with so many other companies. Okay, now, microservices. So we are trying to say that how would we actually content come, how would we create services out of all our application functionality we have and then create them up and then deploy them as individual components. So that way, now I, actually, I can actually give more computation power to my login, more computation power to people who are viewing the product catalog, more or lesser computation power to people adding products to a cart, lesser to making a purchase. So I can decide that number according to the heat map that we spoke earlier. That way, I have a very tailor-made bill that I make a payment for all my computation. I can actually have it in-house deployed, that is within the company's own data centers, or go to the cloud. 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 So this is a new term. You say cloud. We just spoke about a new company called AWS. So what AWS had actually done, until then, companies were actually hosting all the applications within their premise. It's called in-premise deployment, it's called data center deployment. So each and every company used to have its own data center. How many companies are we aware of? Can you just say the biggest number? 500, 600,000. 500, 600,000. Any guess? What will be the largest number? 10,000. More? 500,000 such companies are there which have their own data centers. And the largest company of all these being Apple, which has their own data centers into seven different continents. Yeah, it's their own data center. They don't use it for anyone else. Unlike AWS, which is like hosting service, which was which is for everyone else. They use it, using it for, for their own purpose. See how much amount of data they are storing, how much amount of computation they have. So AWS came up and said, hey, you actually have don't have to do that. We'll build a shared computation compiler. Shared computation facility 
for everyone, every such one is going to use a computation and that is called a cloud. Cloud, beautiful part. Now, the cloud is just a huge data center for storage and has CPUs and all these things. But then Amazon said, okay, how about I, pro I provide you a database instead of you bringing a database. I provide you a database. Use my own database, which is customized, tailor-made for my own infrastructure. It has every other feature like your regular database. How about I provide you something like an application server where you can put your application. You don't bring your application server. I know you have built it for an application server. Don't bring it. You keep it on your own premise. I provide you an application server. How about I provide you something like security infrastructure? That is a firewall and all these things. And that is where Amazon said, cloud native. So everything is native to the cloud. You don't bring anything. You already have all these things. Something like you go to the hotel, you don't take your plate to the hotel. The hotel they already provides you a plate to you. They provide you water, they provide you a glass for that. But unlike in your hostel, you will have to take all your glass, plate, everything, because you don't want to share it. But in a restaurant, it doesn't happen like that. You, you just walk into the restaurant with the wallet, yes. Without that, they won't help you. They won't ask you also, do you have a wallet? But you can just walk in. The same is the concept of cloud also. You just walk into a cloud with your application. That's it. Take your application. They're providing you all the other infrastructure. So, what, what are the advantages you get out of doing something like microservices? First thing you are doing loose coupling. What is loose coupling? Your application is not tightly coupled. In the sense, every part of the application, when they want to talk to one another, they're tightly coupled. In a monolithic architecture, they're tightly coupled. They sit next to each other, the code is shared. So they're tightly coupled. Now they're all loosely coupled. Each service is like standing, sitting on its own infrastructure, on its own computation needs. So when I want to talk to someone here, I say, my name is this thing. And this guy says, my name is this thing. We introduce to one another. Then I tell this guy, this is my name. This guy says, I can do this thing. Yes, OK, fine. Then the competition is fine. That is what a microservice is going to do. If you had to do it in a sort of monolithic architecture, I had to talk all to five, all the five guys and say, OK, this guy can actually do this. All the five others can't do it. But the problem is, this guy will work with this guy only. So now, I have to take all the five years together and then do it. So, the paradigm changes. With the microservice architecture, you have a loosely coupled way of doing it. The next thing is the technology diversity. Technology diversity is like, you know, you can deploy it to cloud, you can have it in, within in-premise, have your own data center, programming language needs for each and every service, one service built in Python, one service built in JavaScript, one service built in Java. Why? Why do that? So the first statement, as I said, when we started, every programming language has its own strength. C programming language has been built for system programming. It is the best, it's still the best, it is going to be the best for system programming. When I say system programming, it is like when you want to talk to the hardware, hardware directly, C is still the best. Of course, there are programming languages which are coming, Upcoming, I started using a new programming language called Rust. It also is similar to C, but it has its own memory capability, which is something C lacks. C does everything using pointers, but Rust programming language doesn't do anything like pointers. It does it in a very different way. Now, if you take Python, Python is best suited for anything like data computation, data science, and all this. It has a huge library available for data science. If you take Java, Java is hugely, hugely, hugely used within the business application development. Like all your internet commerce applications, they are mostly built in Java. Because of its own capability of the way it uses computation, the underlying computation, Java is very much suited for that. If you take JavaScript, all the printed applications are mostly built using JavaScript. Except mobile technology, most of the web technology is all built using JavaScript. Then there are other hundred different programming languages like that, 
which brings in the diversity, technology diversity. Right? Fault tolerance. Fault tolerance. One of the services comes down, the other application is still not in fact. That is what is called fault tolerance. This is also built into your regular day things that you use regularly. Fault tolerance is also built into something like if you have a security feature like let's say heat detection, smoke detection, right? Building such a security feature wherein uh, at least not in India it's still not a standard but in the western countries because they, they live in a cold age, they need heat detection, they need smoke detection, smoke kills and heat kills and then the entire thing actually comes down immediately. So they use the heat detection system very much and that's where all problems comes in. So it will tolerate the heat till a certain level and then beyond that level it will immediately make a call to the nearest fire station, nearest police station saying that hey, this particular building has a problem. You need to intervene. Same is the case. Something is failing consistently four times, five times, and then it fails. Then there are fault tolerance systems in the background which are immediately taken and say, oh, there is a problem with this component. This component has actually gone down. Let me take a read all these things right into a simple file structure so that if, if the component is like redeployed next time, I can read it from the files as well as take all the incoming papers. That's what happens when you order something online and Amazon says we had a problem but we are working on it. It will send you a small email. We are very sorry for this thing. Your order is actually in process. Just one minute later, two minutes later, you will get a mail saying that oh, your order has been processed. You have accepted the payment. Your delivery is in process. That's called call problems. That happens. See, every system is bound to fail. No system in this world can be built without failure. Every system is bound to change. But the only thing is, how quickly do you respond to a failure? Very important. That is where quality comes. You buy a Mercedes car, Mercedes Benz. You know what is their uh, tagline? Their logo or their tagline? Best car now. They say, if, they, if you have a problem with our car, just call our car center. Within three hours, Either by a chopper, by road line, by airline, they'll bring in a dedicated car for you. That is a replacement car. They'll take your car, they'll give you a replacement car. Until they, your car is fixed, you can use their car. That's the sort of quality they want. That is what is called quality. Right? We are talking about this in software. High cohesion. High cohesion is trying to say that, okay, Components can talk to one another with a certain limit of how the components can talk to one another. That is, you are trying to say, this is this is the contract. When you want to talk to me, this is what you have to tell You go to a bank, obviously you can't, you, know, you go to a bank and you can't buy something in a bank. It has a contract. You go to something, something like a shoe store, you can't buy clothes there. It has a contract. So everything has a contract with one another. That way, Every other service is telling to the other service that if you don't need to talk to me, this is my authentication, this is my security, this is the way you have to talk to me. This is what I, I will expect, this is what you can expect. Contracts. Scalability. <coughs> this has been a very key factor. Scalability has been a very key factor right from the beginning to what we do today also. Ease of deployment. Now it's not a single large application that I deploy into million devices. I'm like, okay, I know that more devices should be there for logging, more devices for product catalog, lesser number of devices for making a payment, lesser devices for product tracking, full thing. So I, I deploy according to, accordingly to my scalability needs. Right? Then comes in, so what I've done, uh, not sure I can run you through the entire application. I used to do these talks way back. We did it for a client. The client had a huge monolithic application around 2 gig. 2 gig. And they had their own data center. They had close to 240 boxes. 
two party to go with two gig will be around 500 gig. Every time they make a change, they used to fly like this. So now uh, we were a consulting company. Uh, we were asked to actually bring in a new architecture into their ecosystem, and then we were maintaining them for, for some time. So then we have actually, I have actually done this entire presentation for them, and then we said, this is your problem. We have a huge application. But the problem is, every time you, you make a change, you deploy the whole thing, it has a small problem. You redo the whole thing. This was like a, a small online store they had. It was a photo gifting service. I don't remember the name correctly. So, it was a photo gifting service. People can actually come to their site, upload their own photos, either from their Google photos, Facebook photos, or Instagram, or other such photo servicing. Photo service is there. Store it on the uh, particular application that was there. And then they could create frames out of it, calendars out of it, which could be gifted to their near and dear ones on festivals like Thanksgiving and stuff like that. That was the service they had. And they had a, a good business model and they had a good revenue model also. On a peak day, that is during Thanksgiving, they used to do a billion dollar of transaction, profit and loss during those business, during those days of Thanksgiving, which is around last week of November. Seven to eight days, they used to do a billion dollar of business. But the only problem was they had And during those days, as I said earlier, they used to deploy a hell number of boxes. And then everybody, including us, consulting team, we were like online 24 by 7, we were like watching what's happening at each and every transaction. If anything is failing, if everything was failing, the siren you heard, it used to actually we used to blow the car and say, hey, something went wrong. Immediately we used to go into a war room, look at what was happening and then start this. That was the first year. We were also pissed off during the end of first year. We said, okay, let's design something fresh, present it to them, tell them what is the ROI. What is the investment they need to make? What is the return they are expecting out of it? And then, how do we bring in, bring in a minimum viable product? MVP. Keep this term, remember this term. This is the term you should be using for yourself also. Minimum viable product of yourself. Incrementally. Never do or think that you will achieve that goal in one year by the end of 365. No. You can't do that. There are only a handful of people who have actually done that. You will have to take baby steps. Put goals for yourself. We also did the same thing. <coughs> we said minimal viable product. End of two months, this is what we are, we, are, we are going to give you. This is what is going to be production. End of four months, end of six months, nine months, one year. We did that feed with zero defects by the end of 11th month. And the client was so impressed. They gave us the contract for the next seven years. Next seven years. And they said, guys, we want you to take us to the cloud. We don't want to use the data center anymore. You know why? The bill for their data center came down by 20%. 20%. They were paying $100, let's say, they started paying only $80. By the end of our deployment cycle, we are paying only $80. And we propose them, if you go to the cloud, you actually can bring it down to 55, 50 or even 40 or That is because on a non-billion dollar day, you don't need that infrastructure. See, they are there, we don't turn it on. But the problem is, these things, we don't turn it on for a certain amount of time. They go cold. They go cold. That is, they become useless. They have to be running. They have to be running. Then the problem with the microservices, a micro a microprocessor, is it is continuously running. It goes cold, it immediately dies off. So what the operating system does in the background is it computer it is it computes the value of pi to an end that arbitrary value so that it keeps the processor always busy. 
So even if you shut the lid down, you think that everything is down. No. No. It doesn't happen like that. The microprocessor always is running. Only that it goes into dormant mode. Where it recalculates, 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 recalculates. That is, make sure that it is always alive. So we explain the same thing. You have a data center, you are thinking that you have brought it down to 20% you will turn off this entire rack. On a billion dollar day you will turn this on. No, on a billion dollar day that won't turn on actually. Because they go cold. So what's the solution? Go to the cloud. You can pay per view, that is pay on demand. Today you need only 100 boxes, you pay for 100 boxes. Tomorrow you need 200. It is Amazon's problem or it's Microsoft's Azure's problem that they scale you up immediately to your need. Not your problem anymore. And you can test it beforehand, that is before the actual billion dollar day comes to you in your particular veranda. You can actually test it. 10 days before that, they do that, experiment it and they say, okay, we are ready, launch it. And that is when I learned the word called MVP, the importance of the word called MVP. Believe me, it has changed a lot. Every time I intend to do something, I say, what is the MVP? Let's build milestones. Put a milestone. milestone what, do you know what is a milestone? You go on the road, you see a stone, that's called a milestone. It says one kilometer finish. But 320 kilometers to Hyderabad. Right? It's, it's like reminding you that you have okay crossed one kilometer, there are 320 more. So it actually taught me a lot, and I had actually taught it a lot. We were able to do that to the client, and the client was very impressed with that. So we initially we broke it down from this architecture to this architecture, and then from this architecture. We, we actually use something called microservice 12 factors. There is a site called 12factor.net. Uh, it was like a paper done in Carnegie Mellon University on how do you build microservices. Some nice guy, I don't know his name or her name, actually dedicated these things. They said, these are the factors you have to follow. So the site's name is also 12factor.net. It's a beautiful site. No, no pictures, no images, no advertisements, nothing. It's like a research site. You just go there, browse by each and every one of these things, you understand why. What are the problems? Right? This was the resulting architecture. They said, okay, bring in Navy and Navy. Each one of them is a service. Then you have a configuration service. A configuration service actually holds all the configuration requirements of your application. What is the configuration requirement? What is, the, what is the server's address? What is the server's port on which it is listening? Port. Right? Configurations like what is the private, private key? What is the, let's say, any such configuration actually sits in the config service. And that config service keeps on sharing the data every time it gets an update. So these applications don't store the configuration on their own, it stores the configuration. And then the last one is about discovery. Why discovery? It's like every time you add a new service, that is you add a new instance, you don't tell this service that there is a new instance or this service there is a new instance. You will tell this service. The discovery service. It's like discovering that there is a new instance. Okay, there are 50 instances. So automatically the load balancing happens. I know these are new terminologies, it will be a little confusing, it takes time, time to sink in. It happened with me even when I had a good failure experience it happened with me. But that's how you'll have to stand in the industry. Learn every day. Learn every day. It will have to be a continuous journey of learning for you. What are you what are field you choose? Void of being it being IT or it being mechanical, automotive, anything you choose, every day should be a learning. You should learn something every day and then progress it into the next. So this was the final architecture we bought in and then we thought, okay, so we'll tell the customer that we are going to use Spring Framework, uh, which is one of the frameworks which is built at least in Java and, and .NET also. Uh, Spring Framework contributes a lot for cloud-based applications and microservice-based applications. 
Um, let's not talk more about this because we are still in the early stages of C programming, Python. It will take some time to sync it. Do take your time to sync in to program, to writing programs, 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 and more programs. So, what are all the other, you know, microservices doesn't stop there, just applications. People have taken it to beyond a limit. There's something called IAS, Infrastructure as a Service. That is something like, let's say, web service, web servers, application servers, log servers, or let's say you wanted to have a server dedicated only for uh, sending SMS, server dedicated sending streaming data, streaming audio, streaming video. Everything is an infrastructure, infrastructure as a service. The next thing is product as a service. Product. Products are like, let's say, you have something like PowerPoint, right? PowerPoint. The company that owns it is called Microsoft. So what Microsoft does, is they have a product as a service called Office 365. They have productized the entire thing and giving it to you as a service. So your data sits actually in the cloud directly. You can share it across on the internet directly. Backend as a service, database as a service, SAS, software as a service. The entire software itself is available as a service. And then, this is how these things actually work. The on-prem everything is set in together in your own infrastructure, that is in your own data center. Infrastructure as a service, only these things are sitting in your data center. These things are provided to by the infrastructure provider. Platform as a service, Again, software as a service. So the whole paradigm changes. So as you step into the industry, you would start listening more of these things. Take your time to sink in, learn these things, because the industry would want you to learn these things beforehand. Even today, when, when we have pressures coming in, Institutes like NIT, IIT, all the top scale uh, engineering institutes. Unfortunately, only some of them actually are trained enough, uh, either self trained or industry trained, they are trained enough to actually step in and start doing a daily work. So they can't occupy a desk immediately, they are not productive immediately. It has a psychological effect both on the individual as well as on the other team that they are stepping in. And the problems that it creates is people somehow they somehow they adjust sometimes. They are not able to they are not, they are not able to adjust sometimes and they step away. Because it's human tendency that if you fear something, you step away. You don't want to fight with it, you step away. The simplest way of solving a problem, step away. No. Fight the problem. Take baby steps. You will fail today, you will fail tomorrow, you will fail the year, you will fail, you will fail for 100 days. I don't know how many of you know the story about Einstein, uh, sorry, Edison. Edison, this gentleman actually has 110 patents on his name. But you know, all these 110 patents were, act were actually a failure, which became a failure. Because he was actually trying to invent light bulb, light bulb and then every time he was doing an experiment, it failed, people thought, wow, it should be actually given a patent, patent. and that's how he had a patent for electricity, he had a patent for turbine, what not, he had a patent for electricity, but almost all those 110 patents he had were actually a failure, he was like, shh, I didn't invent a bulb, I should try again, but people thought it a different way. Your failure might be taken by someone else as a success. Your failure is not your failure, it's a success for someone else. So don't stop at a failure. With that, um, I'm almost to the end of the uh, session I wanted to talk on microservices. But yes, I have a beautiful uh, Git repo that I have created with application sample and stuff like that. 
I will try share it with uh, Mr. Chimas. Uh, but actually, given this beautiful opportunity, and of course, my good friend Vinky with Gibson coming here, he was telling, hey, there is this institute, I keep on connecting with them. And we have this new uh, concept called Base Developer. We are connecting with them for an industry connect program. It is through the three have initiative that we have. It's a beautiful thing. See, you won't believe, uh, at least in the Western Hemisphere, universities and industry actually work hand in hand. Every other company we know of today has actually started as a product out of a university and componentized itself as an enterprise. Believe me, Microsoft, uh, Apple, that is not Apple, Microsoft by itself, Facebook, Facebook Instagram, Almost all these companies have actually been in. We actually started out as a university research project. We as the industry have not started any of these things. Of course, Apple's story is a little different. Uh, that guy was more interested into building a computer for personal usage, it's called a personal computer or personal idiot box. And he was actually a very enthous enthusiastic engineer who didn't do anything about electronics. Apple. Steve Jobs didn't do anything about electronics. He was a marketing team. His concept was, they should look beautiful. They should look like an art. Even today, products from Apple look like an art. They are a piece of art. More than a product, they are a piece of an art. And they are sold like an art only. <laughs> you go to an art collection, Everything that you don't understand is sold in millions and billions. We don't understand what is happening, why are they selling these things for millions and millions. While you look at the same thing, someone else like, you know, maybe a simple artist, roadside artist, might have drawn something which is more understandable and more related to you. I'm like, because you have just drawn a line and he says this is a million dollars. Gosh, that is what is with Apple. But they are a piece of art and you'll have to treat them, treat them like art. They're very valuable. They can be very valuable. I am an Apple enthusiast, fanboy, for a long, long, long time. And I still am a fanboy. I bought my first Apple book way back in 2012 when it was around Honda Flags in Ayana. Now it, its price should be, my price correct, it should be around 4 lakhs. I said, what? 200 lakhs for a particular MacBook? Are you serious? Yes, I was in the US at that time, so I bought it. Then I bought an iPhone. 20, no, 2019. That was around a lakh fifteen thousand. You said, what? An iPhone could one lakh fifteen thousand you could bought a a, a high-end bike actually, motorcycle actually. I bought an iPhone. I used it only for two years. Give it off to my son. <laughs> yes, I gave it off. So it's a piece of art. Uh, so it all started like that with that guy and then just changed the entire thing. By the time 2007 iPhone was introduced, iPhone was 50 years ahead of any other product in the market at that time. That's the power of innovation. And that's what we all want. In fact, we are lecturers, we are all your professors, professors, you are born. We want you to be 15 years or a deep bound period ahead of whatever is happening in the industry right now. That's all. Uh, anyone else has any other questions, you can actually drop me a question. I can drop a question. Mr. Shilma, Venti, or we have a connect. Um, but I bring in more concepts, more such lectures, more such lectures into your system. We definitely want you to succeed.